thank you all for being on time. It's early, early by libertarian standards. I hope you're enjoying our neighbor's music this morning. And I'm really just honored that by the particular people that we have. I know I don't know everybody as well, but I know we have Josh and Dan and Aaron and Mr. Well and Reza and Mr. Phil. Phil. No, and and um, I want to take this opportunity to lay out what is an important strategic uh, adjustment for the party, for the movement, and a recognition of what our principles really imply. And I really am glad that, uh, that, that Mr. Wells is taking the time to listen to this. And I know that uh, there are there's some elephants in the room, and I'm going to get through my the gist of my presentation. And what I want to say about localization and principle and philosophy and the strategy implications for the Libertarian Party. But I hope we can turn this into a discussion. I hope that you'd be willing to engage. And, and, and as I've said from uh, the beginning of this race for me, when people were setting up and saying, you're going to be running against Bill Weld in 2020, I said, you know what? I would rather Bill Weld be the nominee than me if he embraces this platform. I really don't care. I can't emphasize how much enough this is not about me. When, when I say now that I'm running for president on the platform of dissolving the federal government, people say, oh, you're running for president. I cringe. You know, I really cringe. I don't think there's anything more anti-libertarian, anti-freedom you can say than I want to be president of the United States. I want to be in charge of this giant coercive monopoly. I want to be in charge of this central authority that imposes its will on everyone else. And I know we had a, a bit of a confrontational interview yesterday, Bill. And if uh, if you're willing to redo that today after hearing me out and understanding what I'm presenting in terms of localization as a principal pragmatic platform, I'd like to have that more reasoned discussion with you. And I'd like to invite you to do that after this when, when uh, we, we have some more time. We, we have an hour and a half allotted for this. I was originally told I was going to have 10 minutes. So um, I am going to be dancing for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> and I can't think of something more interesting to say than this. But the, the concept is very simple. And the concept of libertarianism is very simple. Now, a lot of us, as we transition from being status to libertarian, or discover that we're libertarian, we call it waking up often. I think that's a terrible analogy. Because it feels like an awakening, right? You feel like you're waking up, you feel like you're becoming aware of something. But you don't go back to sleep. You cannot unsee what you have seen. Even Mr. Weld, in the transformation that he's undergone, in his career in politics, knows that there are certain things you can't go back to. You can't go back to advocating for evil once you understand that it is evil. You cannot unlearn what you have learned, you cannot unsee what you have seen. And what this message comes down to is ethics. When people say, oh, you're getting into politics, it's another thing that makes me cringe. No, this isn't politics. This is anti-politics. Politics is a conversation of who do we point the guns of government at to organize society? And the libertarian answer is nobody. Because it's freaking wrong. It's wrong to hit, to steal, to kill. Thou shalt not. It's not unless you're a cop, unless you're an IRS agent, unless you're a soldier and a politician who orders you to go kill someone on the other side of the planet. These are absolute ethical principles. This is the core of the party. When we join the Libertarian Party, we all sign a pledge. And it's the non-aggression form, or non-aggression principle, in the form of a pledge. Simply, I oppose the initiation of force to achieve political or social goals. What a beautiful thing to assert. It's a hard thing to live up to. Now, a lot of times, we look at the aesthetics, how we want society to look as a result of applying this principle, right? We want a world of universal nonviolence. Because if there's violence, it means that someone's rights are being violated. Someone is not free. We want a free society. We want a voluntary society. 
And the aesthetics of this end up getting confused when we think of this as a political message. How many of you think of libertarianism as pro-gun? Right? You guys, can, you guys can raise your hands enthusiastically. I know it's something was the wall. acting his music in the room. We think of libertarianism as pro-gun because you have a right to self-defense, no one has a right to take that away. But the libertarian position in terms of what is policy is not pro-gun. <laughs> it's not anti-gun. It's pro-private property. I own myself, therefore I have a right to own property, and nobody else has any right to tell me what form that property can or cannot take. Whether it's a gun, or a sword, or a grenade launcher, or a tank in my front yard, right? But that means that we have to acknowledge that if you want to be anti-gun on your own private property, as a matter of personal preference, you have that right. And this is where I think the Libertarian Party, since the beginning, has gotten it wrong. Confusing the aesthetics with the ethics. If you are anti-gun, and you want no guns allowed on your property, you're allowed to set that policy, and it's wrong for me to violate that, to impose my preferences, my aesthetics on you. So we have to acknowledge, if you want a community where guns aren't allowed, and you bring people together on your own private property and say, we're going to form a community together on land that we've legitimately acquired, and we want to set the policy that guns aren't allowed, we have to respect that, right? I'm not going to live there, obviously. I think I have some, I think I have some credentials speaking on this issue of the, of the firearms rights issue, right? For those of you who don't know, I went to jail for four months for firearms civil disobedience in Washington, D.C. And I'm very proud of taking that stand. I wish I had better thought out the legal implications and strategy following that. I wish I had some better legal consultants in that issue. I know Bill could have been some help in that case. It was the same thing with drugs, right? And we want to we wanna argue the, the principled case on an individual level. We want to say as libertarians, no one but you has the right to decide what you put in your own body. And it's criminal for me or the government or anybody else to forcefully interfere with your ability to decide what goes in your body. But there are communities of people who are anti-drug. There are people who say, I don't want any drugs in my home. And we would have to respect that right. There are people who are going to want to come together in communities and say, we don't want drugs in this community. And everybody in this community agrees by contractual obligation that we want to set the policy that drugs aren't allowed in this community. Now, I'm going to respect your right as a community to do that. I'm probably not going to go to any of your parties, but I'm going to respect the right in your community to set that policy. Now, libertarians, we like to argue, because we know well, we we're right about everything. We just have to prove it. <laughs> Does that win friends and influence people? Feel free to interrupt, Dan. Yeah, so it's an interesting question, because I debate this a lot. You talk about the idea that communities you could set up the principle where we would sign contracts and agree that people in the community won't do drugs. Do you believe that there are certain inalienable rights that you cannot give away via contract? You would be violating that contract and there would be appropriate sanctions, so there would still be ways to set that up in your private property. So like you can do that in a way that is still accomplished through private property agreements. So if you and I came together, just say the two of us are yeah. private property, so we're gonna create the two of us Freedom Farm community, and it's Dan's property and Adam's property next to each other, and we agree to put up a sign in front of both of our properties together and say, this is Freedom Farm, and drugs aren't allowed here. And then I bring drugs in onto my property. I am violating my contractual agreement with you. So it's not that I'm, I'm, uh, I, I give up that right by entering this contract with you, but I take on a contractual obligation that would have appropriate sanctions for violation of that contract. What do you think would be appropriate? Do you think that's something that would justify force? It would depend upon the, the, the contractual obligation. I would say no, generally. And right now we live in a world where we don't have the nonviolent mechanisms 
generally right. to deal with bad actors, right? So what I would like to see in, in, in the, the volunteer society that I would envision is that when someone violates a contract and someone is a bad actor, then we do have non-violent remedies. Because really the only legitimate use of force is an immediate defense of a threat of force. Right. So if there was if there was in that violation of the contract, I was I was stealing from you somehow, um, and this it would have to be very complicated. Right. And would it be justified in terms of using violence against me personally in my physical body for violating a contract? If I'm not, you know, if I don't have a fist raised, I would say no. I think well specifically what I think about in this case is uh, Stormy, whatever her last name is. Stormy Daniels, and she has a contract that is inhibiting her ability to speak. Uh, I personally believe you can't negotiate away. I mean, you could negotiate and say, I won't agree not to speak on this, and there would be a financial penalty. Right. But she says that she's going away at that point, that point in time. Right. But apparently, under our current system, she could actually be prosecuted for this. I don't right. Know. And I'd say that would be wrong. So it would, it would, it, what, would be, what would be legitimate? So, like, hypothetically, uh, if I gave you a dollar, and you write a contract and say, I'm not going to talk about anything that you talk about in your morning breakout at the Texas LP, right? And I gave you a dollar, and you agreed contractually that you weren't going to talk about anything we talked about in this room, and you went out and you immediately did it. I can say that you stole that dollar from me by fraud. You deprived me of my property, either by violating the contract or entering into that contract fraudulently. And if I felt strongly enough about it, I would be justified in using force to reclaim that dollar. That would be really dumb, and I think it's really bad economic practice, and I think it's a very inefficient way of seeking justice. It would be more appropriate in what we should be developing, and what we are developing, and, and largely the internet is a huge force of accountability in this, is that if you were to do something like that to me, then I would call you out, call you to account, and I would call you before the world, before the community, and say, we have someone who's a bad actor, we have someone who violated a contract, he owes me a dollar, and I would ask that you not do business with him until he makes good on his debt. <laughs> right. So in the case of Stormy Daniels, if she has a contractual agreement, she agreed to, sit, to, to accept $130,000 to not talk about it, and then she talks about it, then she now owes whoever paid her that, that $130,000 back by that contract. Right. So then how we deal with that depends on the people involved who have a stake in that circumstance. Right. And then I think where it gets a little complicated is she has a hundred times damage clause, and so it's what it was one hundred thirty thousand dollars is now thirteen million dollars. Yeah, and that's where it sort of becomes interesting to me as to could you lose your rights because you're not good at negotiating contracts, or do we have certain inalienable rights that you can't negotiate away? Well, Look, a court would throw that hundred times clause right out. Oh really? Yeah. Like that one. All right. Unenforceable is not a public clause. Well, see, this, so this is where it comes down to the market being a better mechanism of accountability than force or government, right? Now, sometimes we, we like to draw this line about, does it violate the non-aggression principle? And if it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, we can't do anything about it because we're libertarians. If it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, it's within your rights. Well, not necessarily. And the thing is that we forget our market preferences that we express <laughs> in everything that we do, every dollar we spend, are in effect, the same mechanism of accountability that we would apply if someone violated the non-aggression principle. Right, so if Stormy Daniels does that, and, and, and Donald Trump can legitimately say, hey, according to this contract, she owes me $13 million, and the general public goes, well, we'll still pay to go see her dance. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the decision of the market. Now, if Stormy Daniels is going to try to set up some other politician the same way, She's probably not going to get away with it, and that person has the right to disassociate. Ultimately, the best mechanism of accountability is not force, it's not retaliation, it's disassociation. So then under your plan, typically with contracts, to the best of my understanding, you're looking for mutual benefit, right? There must be mutual exchange and, and, and some benefit for it. If there isn't, it isn't really a contract, right? So you're saying you would let the market decide whether or not the contract was actually fairly reciprocal. Right. Like if I went to someone, you know, so if I went to someone who was, you know, in a, in a borderline comatose, and I said, hey, uh, if you don't sign this, we're going to take your home. And I sort of trick them without, without lying to them, but I'm taking advantage of them. I get them to sign away their house to me. And then I go, ha ha, look, everybody, I legitimately own their house because they signed it away to me. 
the, the market is going to say, no, that's, that's bullshit. And you're a shady dude, and not only are we not going to recognize your right to own that property, we're going to assume that you're a squatter, but we're also never going to do business with you, and we're going to make sure that nobody ever does business with you again. So I want to get away from that. Thank you, Dan. That's, that's a bit of a sidebar, and it is important sort of the, the background understanding, making sure that we at least understand where I'm coming from on this, but I think that we're all on the same page on how these principles apply. So as libertarians, we want to argue. Right? We want to argue about principles, we want to argue about policy, we want to show everybody that we're right about it. And I don't think that's leadership. I think this is where we have failed as a party. Where we've tried to say we're right about everything, vote for us, and we have the answers. And not only that, when we say, I'm going to be president of the United States, what you're saying is that I have the answer for the entire country. And what we're doing with that is we're playing their game, we're playing the government's game. We're, we're, we're granting them their assumptions that are already imposed on all of us. That we should be forced into a one-size-fits, nobody but the profiteers, obviously, kind of false solution. So what would this look like? How does this change our ability to message? Now, when you're talking about a locality, well, obviously you have a community to respond to. We have a lot of people here who are coming up to me saying, hey, I'm running for you know, state rep, I'm running for city council, I'm running for whatever position it is. Now, we live in a, you know, obviously we live in a very status world. And when you have something that's being made uh, as a decision policy-wise at the community level, and you might say, oh my gosh, that status, you're using government to, do, to accomplish something, like in a, in, a, in a city, for example, like a, there was a, a community recently in Lexington, uh, Kentucky, by the way, it was the, the name of the development, if you guys know where I'm going with this, has anybody, anybody heard the story where they made uh, 11 dog breeds banned? The name of the community was called McConnell's Terrace. <laughs> I thought it was Terrace when I read it, like it was a misspelling of it. There's some weird naming systems in Kentucky. McConnell, you know, like, here's McConnell. I didn't even make that connection until someone else pointed it out to me. The name of the community was McConnell's Trace. And the developer was able to say, ahead of the home, uh, superseding the homeowners association, we are going to make these 11 dog breeds banned in our community. And then they said, well, we heard from both sides of the issue, and there was some contention, and things are changing now, and there's a big uproar. But it goes back to that, do you want a community with no guns, no drugs? You can have that. Do you want a community where dogs aren't allowed? You can have that. And the problem is the lack of conscientiousness among the people who bought, you know, buy those homes. Because obviously, you live in the United States, you pay property tax. You're not an owner, you're a renter. Your ownership, your right to that property is conditional. But it's even worse when you buy, buy a home in a development and you sign a contract that agrees to submit to the whims of a homeowners association and a development corporation, and you don't even get a say in that, but in a sense you have contracted away what you might, Dan, say is an inalienable right on your property, but the reality of the contract is you never owned that property in the first place. You had, a, you had a, essentially what would be more accurately legally described as a long-term lease. And so I won't object, and I think this is an important thing for the libertarians to say as well, like, look, we're just common sense, ethical people who want communities to be able to organize how they see fit. I want people who are running for state and local offices to be able to advocate for status policies when they know that that's the best approximation of what the market would provide when you have this overarching monopoly on force known as the federal government imposed on everyone else. But this is the promise of localization to restore power to communities and eventually down to the individual, although I think we should start saying up to the individual rather than down to the individual, right? So the federal government of the United States is not going to last forever. When should it end? I would say, yeah, yesterday, thank you. I would say as soon as possible. So there's nothing holding us back from this. Now, I thought that in talking about this platform, I've done you know, four national tours now talking about this, and the biggest, uh, what, what I thought was going to be the biggest objection was, but don't we need a military to keep us safe? 
And, and I, I, I heard this talking to Bill yesterday. Even. And I think it's one of the most dangerous myths of statism. The militaries exist for our protection. Yeah, surprise, surprise, governments are lying to you about that too. And this really is the one big thing that's holding us back intellectually, that, that keeps us attached to the state. We have to have a state to keep us safe. It protects us from foreign invaders. Having a military makes us less safe. The founders of this country were against a standing army for a reason. They knew from their experience in Europe that the promise of militaries to protect ended up leading to the greatest abuses by government. Now when I say that having a military makes us less safe, I don't just mean it in the sense that I experienced personally in Fallujah in 2004 with the Marines where we were making enemies faster than we could kill them because the global war on terror was engineered that way. It was possible in the first place because we fell for the premise of government, of the protection rank. But the idea of how a military makes us less safe is even more fundamental than that. When you are told in school that wars are fought between countries. It was America versus Japan versus Germany versus China versus Russia. There is a huge lie behind that in the very premise of that statement that wars are fought between countries. If you think about it for a second, you realize that it's bullshit. Wars are not fought between countries. They are conducted by governments using violence to expand their protection rackets. There's a reason Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires. And the founders knew this, that when you told your government, please rule me, please govern me, please take half my income, just protect me from China. That is exactly what makes you a juicy target for another government that would come in and do what? Govern you. Govern you. Protect you like a cow. Like a farmer protects his cow. When you tell your government you're willing to submit to that racket, that's exactly what gives another government the incentive to come in and take over. This is why the founders advocated for a militia defense. Because they knew that the best defense of any free people is a well-armed population that refuses to be governed by anyone. Here, here. Now, turns out they're really only right about half of that. I think Gandhi proved that the well-armed part is actually Optional. Now, if you want to look at this in pure military terms, if you have a group of people that want to defend against another group of people, do you really want to line up all your all your most capable, willing young men and women in silly costumes to meet in the middle of a field where none of them live and kill each other because they're wearing different colors? Is that really the best strategy? Make it make it easy to have death and destruction on a large scale that ends up with greater collateral damage? Or just look at what happened in the American Revolution. How did a ragtag bunch of colonists defeat the biggest empire that the world had ever known? Guerrilla. Guerrilla warfare. If it really comes down to force on force, China wants to invade America. And by the way, you guys know that the average American is working for government half the year, right? When you add up all the fees, fines, taxes, and other costs of government, for the average working American, you are working for government half the year. And people go, oh my gosh, what if China were to take over? Well, your taxes would probably go down. <laughs> we should be so lucky if a foreign power would come and overthrow this government force and have to start from scratch imposing a new system of taxation and regulation and banking and exploitation. Mil militaries defend government's ability to rule and to govern. 
malicious defend a free people. Now, what I hear most on the campaign trail is, well, I would never vote. I don't even vote. But I would come out and vote for that. And I always make it clear with my campaign that for the first time in American history, the American people will have a real choice. I'm not running for president so much as I'm running to turn the American presidential election into a referendum on whether or not the federal government should be allowed to exist at all. For those of you that don't know my platform, it's one executive order. That's the entire thing. To dissolve the federal government in a peaceful, orderly, responsible manner, leaving us with 50 independent states, five autonomous territories, and up to 562 sovereign native nations. The first thing we're doing is declaring the federal government of no authority, that it's a bankrupt institution, and I resign from the presidency to become custodian of the federal government. If I was running for a political office where I would be exercising inherently just by holding that office in unjust authority, it I would not consider it an ethical thing for me to be doing. But because there's a legitimate free market function here going as a bankruptcy agent, then I know that this is the right thing to do. It's the only legitimate platform for someone running for president as a libertarian. There's a really dangerous debate in this movement, and it's a false one. Actually, there are two I'm going to address. Anybody guess which ones I'm getting at here, some of who haven't heard me go on this before? Okay, principle versus pragmatism, and minarchy versus anarchy. You guys love hearing these debates, don't you, over and over again? <coughs> I'm going to end them right now. Because I've been thinking about this a lot, and it's been really bothering me. I've been in the party since 2004, when I got back from Iraq. It was the first time I could afford the, the lifetime membership. It was cheaper back then. Thanks for the It's $1,000 back then. It's $1,500 now. Principle versus pragmatism. You've heard this before, right? Don't, don't be so principled. Let's be pragmatic. Put aside your principles to do something that's more practical. And what's the result? More of the same. More of the same, right? Now, I'll address what I've addressed publicly about the Johnson Wealth Campaign. It's a losing strategy to say, hey, I'm socially liberal, fiscally conservative, I'm the best of both worlds. Because what, 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 what was the response of the American people in that? They were bored. You mean both shit worlds that we don't want anything to do with? We're the rational ones. We go, come on. Wouldn't Bill Well be a better president than Donald Trump? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Heck yeah. I'm happy to say that. Clearly. Clearly. But there's no reason to sacrifice principle. Because the average voter sees right through that. And it was really about Gary Johnson's platform. Gary Johnson's not a libertarian. He's a libertarian leaning moderate. As far as I know, he's a good guy. I think his record as governor of New Mexico proves that he's a man of integrity. You would think it would be an obvious choice for the American people. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Gary Johnson. <coughs> but they know that if they elect Gary Johnson, fundamentally, not that much is going to change. Because there hasn't been a shift in the thinking about what government is, what its role is. If Why do you think like Trump then? Well, there are a lot of bad reasons to have elected Trump. Yeah. But there were a, we lost we lost a lot of libertarians, mm -hmm. true libertarians, philosophical libertarians, to Donald Trump. Because Gary Johnson did not give them a principled reason to vote for him. Now, one of the things that people give Donald Trump credit for is that he changed America's relationship with the mainstream media. We can all agree that that was a good thing that came out of the 2016 election, right? And Donald Trump rode that hard. Now, Hillary Clinton could have done the same thing. Hillary Clinton, if she was smart, if she was a better strategist, if she was more forward-thinking, she could have seen, you know what? I'm going to be seen as the mainstream candidate. I'm going to be seen as the establishment candidate. Trump is going to be the anti-establishment candidate. And they're going to be interviewing me on mainstream te television shows. I'm going to get all the mainstream 
newspaper media coverage. But people aren't really listening to them with the same, excuse me, with the same sense of authority that they used to have. <clears throat> Let me, Hillary Clinton, go out and say, you know what, it's all about the independent media. I'm going to go and do as many interviews with bloggers and with podcasters and YouTubers and say that the mainstream media, oh, I love them. She's, of course, you know, Stephanopoulos, she's going to have to be nice, right? She's not going to be able to say what Trump said. But she could have made the same play. And she could have made it harder for Trump to be the one who was the anti-establishment, anti-mainstream media candidate. My point with that is that the paradigm had already shifted. Politicians are really good at taking credit for other people's work. Donald Trump may have finished that process, and I don't think it's really done yet, but uh, of shifting the American relationship with the mainstream media. But the work has been done in the decades before. People like Alex Jones, people like the Young Turks, as the big obvious examples you've probably heard of. But really, all of the little players like Adam versus the Man, all of the other independent media outlets that always were there questioning with the counter narrative, no, the mainstream media is full of shit. That's what made it possible. That was what the wave was that Trump rode in. And Gary Johnson was trying to play the middle. Instead of acknowledging the principal core of what it means to be libertarian. This is not a political message. This is an ethical message. This is not politics. This is anti-politics. This debate about principle versus pragmatism is bullshit. Anybody who's trying to tell you, give up your principles to be more pragmatic, is trying to get you to do something that is unpragmatic, contrary to your principles, and the result is always going to be worse than if you stuck to your principles. Principles are pragmatic. That's the point of having principles. President? I've been about that since I was in the book, and I think that Gary Johnson gave them the fact that politics is the worst thing that can happen to anyone. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> we actually had that conversation back in August of 2012, specifically August 17th in Dallas. The problem is, because I had a coach on your ideas back then, and he said, well, we want to make sure that by my interest in the party, we get as much media attention as we can. So I cannot be just talking all of our anarchist perspective, even though that's the Z goal of the alphabet. If we can achieve until F, that's fine. But we have to do a gradual shift. I mean, we don't have the base. We want to give the vote to 5% eventually. So that, and at the breaking point, we can talk more about this. That, that is my need. Yeah, and I, I understand the reason. And, and I, I can provide, and I, and I think I have already, but I can provide the analysis for why that's a losing strategy. Because he gave up the principle, hoping, just what you said. Exactly what you said in the messaging. He gave up, no, okay. He didn't necessarily give up principle. He gave up talking about principle. Okay. But he, he couldn't go on TV and say, well, the, the whole media in Northeast is corrupt. Why not? Well, Why not? They were doing things behind the scenes, but he wouldn't be invited to. He would have had way more support and been able to reach way more people through independent media. Look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump did that, and it worked for him. Right? <laughs> Now, it would have been, no, he, 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 he trolled the mainstream media, and he was able to get more coverage as a result, and the independent media loved him. The alt-right drove the independent media conversation, and they won the election. Trolling is also not, not a principle that we as Americans share. Define trolling. Define trolling. Define trolling. Define trolling. Define trolling. Define trolling. How did Trump begin all that? Oh, he just openly talked trash about the mainstream media. Well, not just that, he talked trash about a lot of other things too. And right, but hold on. If you, want, you want to talk about not having the base? Gary Johnson's strategy lost him the base of the movement. This movement is a lot bigger than the party. What I've seen is that people wake up and they go, all right, I'm a libertarian. Let me get involved in something libertarian. They go to the libertarian party and they hear day-long conversations about commas and periods. 
and what word should go where in in a platform. And they hear people going, should we have should we have a principal candidate or should we pander? And they go, man, fuck this. I'm gonna go grow vegetables. <laughs> fuck this, I'm gonna go start a podcast. <laughs> fuck this, I'm gonna go do jury nullification activism. And I think that's the greatest loss of opportunity because the Libertarian Party has the potential to be the tip of the spear if we can get the movement behind us. And the movement is a movement of principle. Exactly. Exactly. But you don't need it from the Ron Paul camp, as in Ron Paul himself and his lieutenants and the leadership. No. You have someone of principle representing a message that inspires people. That's what will get the grassroots on the board. That's what Ron Paul did differently. You want to look at the success of the impact of the Johnson Wealth campaign, or the Johnson Gray campaign, or the Bob Barr campaign, versus Ron Paul running as a Republican in the Republican primary? The answer is obvious when you ask which one had a bigger impact. It was because Ron Paul spoke the consistent, principled message that inspired people. Now this is another thing about libertarians. We have to acknowledge how different we are from the general population. Not just as the political nerds, but as the super hyper analytical white male INTJ spamming from our parents' basements for Ron Paul kind of political nerds. We always want to tinker. We want to think there's got to be a there's got to be a better way. We see a problem, we think of it as like a Rubik's cube. If we just if we just if we just get it right, if we just get all the things to land, we just analyze this, we just get it perfect. Oh well, then everybody will see that we're right about everything, and it'll be obvious, and they'll vote for us. It doesn't work that way. Drop mice. Different. That's part of it, absolutely. Most people do not think like us. And we have to acknowledge that the inspiration is needed, the passion is needed, the principle is needed. If you go up, and I gotta say, Bill, you have a great demeanor in speaking. You have a very calm, cool, collected, and that really works in a lot of situations. But you also know that even Ron Paul, although he was the grandfather figure, he spoke with a unique passion that motivated and inspired people. And I know you have that. I know despite what all the criticisms that I could raise against you, that you've been in this game for a long time. And you've taken a lot of abuse. And you've kept going. I know there's something in you that's here for something more than an intellectual reason. And if we need to convey that to inspire, to motivate, to make this about the movement and the cause, and make it clear that we're not playing political games, we're not here to pander. We're here to change the world. So you raised the issue about the anarchist stuff, right? We want to come out with an anarchist message. That's bullshit. First of all, this whole anarchist versus minarchist debate, divide in the party, it's really an artificial one. I have yet to hear a definition of libertarian that includes the idea that we should have rulers. Like, I'd love to, Bill, I'd love to sit you down and get you on a gotcha question. Like, Bill, do you think that, that people should have coercive rulers over them? And you would say no, right? And I would say, oh my gosh, Bill, when did you become an anarchist? <laughs> well, let me just say that uh, as I read your platform writ large, it's to preside over the peaceful dissolution of the federal government. The peaceful dissolution of the federal government is a beautiful idea in, in my book. I mean, I. Uh, so, in terms of uh, ultimate ultimate goals, we're practical. I'd be right with you all the way. Uh, I also have sort of the same feeling that you do. Oh, you know, what did this burden could be with it? And I'm doing a lot of work on this stuff. A bunch of conventions trying to get deeper into it philosophically. Uh, although I do consider myself to have been informal libertarian since I was in school. Um, so I don't feel like I'm sailing under false colors. <laughs> I have a lot of background in the uh, mainstream, mainstream world, which uh, you know, the right now you get, you get fleas. There's a lot of non-libertarian shit here. I have to get all this coat before I run, uh, run the full tilt. It's nice to hear you put it that way. That's funny also. I tell them I'm doing this. Uh, you know, one reason is I hate both the political parties in Washington, D.C. There's two things that really uh, animate me. One, I think uh, 
I felt this too much then. Uh, and two, almost equal is the two parties in Washington have gotten so selfish and self-centered. Uh, I, I talk about them being in a uh, you know, reciprocal death spiral of grace. They, you know, they're, they're obsessed with each other. And they do nothing in Washington except try to kill each other by getting more other people elected. And they're not working for the public interest of the people at all. They're working for the money and special interest to and make all their campaigns to get a few more of them elected so they'll have a majority in the House and a majority in the Senate. And it's sick. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not uh, acting in a way that's, that's in the interest of the greatest good of the greatest number of any, anybody other than themselves. So, I, I'm very keen about the idea of the libertarians. You know, I don't think I don't speak so much in terms of, as Gary used to do about you know the six, five, six lane highway right up the hill. You know, just somebody who would uh, have in mind uh, the interests of the people who would be working for the people. And I don't think either of these are, and I think there's an increasing awareness of that in the country clock, which is why I disagree with some of our uh, brother and sister here. I, I say I think the libertarians have the next cycle to go way beyond the threshold to get Absolutely. the wage, 10%. You know, if, if the libertarian candidate gets to 15%, I think that libertarian candidate could get to 40% and win the election. The other candidates I uh, think somebody else was talking about it, but I think the dissolution of the of the weak party in, in the middle of the 19th century is very instructive. There are today's Republicans with two factions. One was called the Know Nothing. And if they, uh, anyone asked you, did you have a meeting? You know, what did you talk about? They were instructed to say, I know nothing. Yeah. It was founded on a hatred of the Catholic movements from Ireland and Germany. So, so their founding principle is negative. The other two characteristics of the dumb is violent rallies and conspiracy theories. <laughs> it is the Donald Trump campaign. And, and fortunately, I think in the future, this is spun into outer space after they spun off from the other Whigs. And the rest of the Whigs uh, joined the Free Soilers, who were really good, John C. Fremont, really good. Uh, Forward-looking anti-slavery party, and they have been like four years later. Um, but I think the Republican Party is, is about to split. I said so in the 16 cycle, and I'm wrong, but I think the force is now. And the libertarians could, could reap a lot from that. Well, if I may bring it back, and just, uh, actually, I want to invite you to continue this later. Um, but things are accelerating so fast right now. Even analyzing it through the old party dynamics ignores the reality of how much the internet has fundamentally changed the conversation and how much faster the, the pace of change is right now. But, but Billy also said that dissolving the federal government wasn't practical. I think keeping the federal government going is impractical. How many of you would like to hear Bill and I discuss that when we're done talking about You and I can have a bunch of conversations. Uh, I, I have a practice, sorry to use the word practical, but a practical consideration. I got to get upstairs at 11 o'clock with telephones, people depending on me in business and legal stuff. So it's, it's not 11.04 right now. Is it really? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> But I would like to have a more practical conversation about whether dissolving the government is practical or not. If you're willing to have that debate, I think that would be the most important one that we could have in terms of policy for the party. And Aaron, before I answer your question, I want to just finish the point about anarchy versus minarchy. Like I said, it's a very dangerous, artificial divide that keeps our movement from being able to unite. And I was really uh, bothered. And not by hearing you say it, but by, by what you invoke when you say, well, you don't want to put the anarchy stuff out. 
Because that's all back, back then. Right. Was, uh, but but because that's that's the argument that we hear a lot to say don't speak on principle. And that's wrong. I've never heard a definition of libertarian that says we should have coercive rulers. Anarchy literally means no rulers. Not no rules, not no organization, not no contractual agreements, not no respect for each other's rights. It means no rulers. So I've never heard an anarchist who identifies as an anarchist say, well, you can't have government if it's voluntary. And this gets back to the thing about localization. Really, the libertarian message should be, you can have as much government as you want, as long as it's voluntary, as long as it's ethical, as long as it's not coercive. I've never heard an anarchist say, you can't have voluntary associations and call them government. Right? Like, if you create a homeowners association, where you're, not, you're going to ban drugs and guns in your community, and you're going to call it government, I'm not going to put a gun to your head and say, no, you can't use that, that's our word. Right? So every anarchist is also a minarchist, in the sense that they're willing to let government do things as long as it's voluntary, to allow people to have that presence. Everybody who's a minarchist who's also a libertarian would also be an anarchist if they say, well, we want government to do these things, but we only want them to be done voluntarily. The divide is not between anarchists and minarchists. Even those terms are meaningless and used only to divide unnecessarily when the real division is between people of principle and people who don't share these principles. People who apply ethics consistently and people who are willing to bend principle for pragmatism. People who say that, no, moral principles are universal. Don't hit, don't steal, don't kill. And when you violate those, you are holding humanity back from its potential of the market of a truly cooperative, voluntary society. <clears throat> I never want to hear those words again in this party, anarchists and anarchists. Because we should be uniting under the one word, libertarian.
You better, you better read the party platform. You better read our statement of principles. I always like to put an audience on the spot. How many of you designed the cut of the shirt that you're wearing right now? Okay, normally there's some smart ass in the back who goes, well, I'm a fashion designer, actually, right? Now, if I was giving a presentation on fashion and design, I could look down my nose at all of you and say, what a bunch of followers. What a bunch of sheeple. You didn't even design the shirt that you're wearing right now. I don't have that much time. Exactly. Sell. Exactly. I sell a lot of my own stuff, and now I don't have that much time. I'm not making all my clothes. And that's how most Americans think about politics. We're also never going to win by saying, oh, the Republican Party is evil, and the Democrats are evil, and life is terrible, but we can save you from that. Because life is pretty good. We've come to an incredible point in human history where we're capable, uh, many times over, of feeding, clothing, housing, providing medical care for everyone on the planet. Even the homeless have cell phones. Yeah, even in America, in America, even the homeless have or, uh, the Obama phones. Right? <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> and it's only government that's holding us back from this. As libertarians, we tend to have a, a problem taking charge. Because we don't like telling other people what to do. And that's a good thing to acknowledge about ourselves, right? But ultimately, what's the most value that we can provide to the world? By taking leadership. And that means bringing people together on principle and on pragmatism at the same time. We don't have to be united under one government to be united in American values. We can unite left, right, and center against the common enemy that is big, centralized government. Now, the other mistake that we made, this is the last point I'll make, is that we want to argue with Democrats and Republicans. If you look at the demographic breakdown of the electorate, it's about 60% of Americans who vote consistently in presidential elections, right? It means 40% consistently never vote. I'd say you could write off about 10% of that, right? 10% of the American population doesn't care. They're, they're, they're either just super curmudgeon or overwhelmed with their personal problems, whatever the case may be. Or they're genuinely just selfish assholes who can't be bothered to come out and vote, even when they know it can help other people. That's fine. But I would say at least 30%, the majority of those people, are some kind of principled non-voters. Most of them just don't vote because they know it's a waste of time. They've come to the same conclusion that the, uh, the recent academic study, can anybody help me here, what was the study? It was that, that uh, public opinion was actually negligible statistically as an influence on national policy, that your vote as an individual is almost irrelevant. They know that it's a waste of time, and they don't want to support the system. They are rationally ignorant. Hey, life is good. They can still get out and do what they want to do. Even with the big constraints of government, like we as libertarians, we always want to see the problem. We always want to see the restraints. Oh, well, you're, you think you're free until you, you know, try to do something that you're not allowed to do. Yeah, it's all legitimate. But for the average human being, we are overwhelmed with how good life is. We can't handle, excuse me? We're overwhelmed with choice. We're overwhelmed with choice, with data, with entertainment, free entertainment on the internet. We have a prosperity that humanity has never seen before. And this is exponential, this is accelerating. You can track it now by Moore's law, right? Computing power doubling roughly every 18 months, whatever. That drives productivity. That drives communications. That drives connectedness. And by the way, about the thing about war and the best effect of the modern population, we don't need that anymore. War is always based on lies. It takes lies to lie to, to young men and women, convince them to kill strangers. How long have they been trying to get a war going in Iran? Boots on the ground in Syria. Remember, I was in jail in 2013 when Obama was trying to do that. What stopped Obama from trying to get boot, from being able to get boots on the ground? Does anybody remember this episode? That's an understatement. It was active duty military members on social media 
holding up silly little placards that said, I did not enlist to fight for Al-Qaeda in Syria. 30%. Those people will never come out and vote for a Gary Johnson. You look at that 60%. How many of those vote consistently in off-year elections? It's less than 40%. Some of you here probably know the numbers better than me. In congressional elections, in off-years, it's two-thirds, roughly. Two-thirds, 40%. But if you go to special elections, local elections, city council elections, a lot of them are down in the 15 to 20% range. That's what I would say, is that it's about a 30% average. When you look at it as a whole, it's about 30% of the eligible American voters who are like, yeah, we got to vote every time. Red team go, blue team go. If we don't vote, it's going to be bad for America. And as libertarians, when we play their game, we are inherently arguing with them that it is a waste of our time. That 30% there, that's 15 Republican, 15 Democrat, roughly. To 30% who vote reluctantly, and 30% who are principal non-voters. We shouldn't be arguing with that 15 and 15. That is a losing game for us. We are guaranteed to lose before the game starts if that's our strategy. If we want to win, we need to build a winning coalition. I know Bill understands this from your experience in the governor's races. That you have to see that these people are going to care about this. These people are going to come out and vote for this. And when you're running as a Republican, you can build on existing coalitions. You can play on people's fears. That's not a game that libertarians want to play, should play, or can even hope to win at. Especially if we maintain a message of principle. As we wake up to libertarianism, things get simpler. You've all heard the models of the flat earth being the center of the universe versus the rock. I, I, now I, I can't, it's funny, you can't raise this out today. I like to say, people used to think the earth was flat in the center of the universe. And then someone goes, some of them do now too. <laughs> By the way, I don't think there are any real flat earthers out there. I think they're all trolling us. That's it. The goal of a flat earther is to convince you that this is like a debate. <laughs> 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 What? Yeah, I love your whole <laughs> They're just trolls. No, they're not that dumb. No one is no one no one is buying that. No, they're no, literally just no, trolls. No, no, no. See, no. they've won. If you think they believe they believe that, then no, work was fun. fun. He yeah, he's with got him. you. He's got you. No. Exactly. <laughs> You've been trolled. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Back, back, to point, back to the bigger point. Back to the bigger point. Because there is this there's this tiny percentage of people I would say are just trolls. I think it's a troll fad thing now to say that you're a flat or whatever. But you gotta, you gotta be different. back to the bigger picture. People used What's to the think different? that the earth was flat in the center of the universe. <laughs> and in order to explain the observations of the orbits of the stars, and other planets, and the sun, they had to come up with all of these fancy equations, way too complicated to explain how, how are these stars moving like this, right? Planets moving against the sun. Planets moving against the sun. Yeah, they were trying to, yeah, they, they had to come up with all these just ridiculous rules of physics. And then someone said, hey, maybe the Earth is round, and it's not the center of the universe. <gasps> And what happened was the equations got really simple. Oh, yeah, normal orbit patterns. The math is way simpler. But for the people who had this model in their head, it was very, very complex. In order to displace it with a simple model, they had to do the math over and over and over again. Like, really? Because I, I invested all this time and energy and had an intellectual investment, an emotional investment in this. This is why it took me. 10 years, and I have to stay humble in this, and Dan, yes, acknowledge that people evolve and people change. It took me 10 years from going, I'm a libertarian, so I'm not going to be a Democrat or Republican, screw that, to understanding what it meant philosophically. And when people are coming at that with integrity, and honestly, I want to encourage that. When I see people go the other way, and Patrick Hillary Clinton, I'm going to be a little on guard about that. The point is, this model is much 
simpler. And for the average human being on this planet, they said, well, the men with fancy hats say the earth is flat, so I guess the earth is flat. Oh, well, the men with fancy hats say that the earth is round, so I guess the earth is round. And we have the potential to say, look, we're the ones with fancy hats. We're taking leadership. We believe in specialization of labor. Well, we're the ones who figured out the government is a racket, and here's a practical way out of it. But I would challenge you to then apply the same thinking to how we apply this to politics. We don't have to learn about every little policy. We don't have to be experts on the law or how government works. We don't have to present a complex platform that says we're going to do every little thing that the president has the power to do. We're going to solve every little problem. We're going to alleviate every little problem. We're going to apply our principles. We're going to have smarter government better. No. The answer is that much simpler. And this is the kind of reluctance that I get from libertarians occasionally talking about localization. Oh, it can't be that easy. Look at all this work that we put into the Libertarian Party and all the policy and, and, and all the effort that we put behind Bob Barr and Gary Johnson. No. It's really that simple. Don't play their game. Acknowledge your own core truth. I guarantee you that's how the Libertarian Party is going to win. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your post and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.